everyone. Thanks for joining us today. The Southern Alliance for Clean Energy is pleased to host the Southeast Coastal Climate Network's webinar series. On behalf of SAIS and the Southeast Coastal Climate Network, I'd like to thank you for attending today. It's your interest and support that makes our work possible. My name is Erin Cameron, and I'm the SAIS Development and Outreach Coordinator, and I will be the acting facilitator for today's webinar. I'd like to take a moment to review your control panel on your screen. Um, we will be recording today's webinar, so your lines will remain muted throughout the presentation. And we ask that you please chat in your questions using the question option on your control panel. Your questions will then be answered in the order they are received at the end of the presentation. Today's presentation will be available on our webinar archive page of our website, cleanenergy.org. And I'd like to now turn the presentation over to Chris Carnivale, SAIS Coastal Climate Network and Energy Coordinator. Thanks, Erin, and thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. My name is Chris Carnivale, and I'm the manager for the Southeast Coastal Climate Network. As you can see on the current slide, the Southeast Coastal Climate Network is a coalition of individuals and organizations spanning the coastal southeast who are working on coastal responses to climate change. We have members as far north as Maryland and as far west as Louisiana um, and everywhere in between. And the purpose of the network is to bring voices together to trade information and synergize our efforts. The Southeast Coastal Climate Network is hosted under the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Our largest tool is our group site website, which is an online platform that enables members to send group emails, post discussion topics, or relevant news to discussion boards, and use a shared group calendar. If you're interested in joining the network and using these tools, please just visit the web address that's on the screen now seccn.groupsite.com and click join this group now. For those of you who are on the webinar and are already members, I want to encourage you to use those tools I just mentioned to help you uh, get your message out. That's the purpose of the group is to encourage communication and collaboration and uh, if you're a member here at your fingertips, you have a receptive group of people who want to hear uh, what you have to say. So please don't be shy, use the web tools, um, and help get your message out. Another great tool we have is our webinar series, of which today's webinar is a part. And today we're joined by Bob Perkowitz from Eco America, who will present us with a snapshot of his work at Eco America and charting a national strategy for getting climate action out of just theory and into practice on a major scale. Bob Perkowitz is founder and president of Eco America, a nonprofit that starts with people and uses consumer research and strategic partnerships to create large scale engagement programs that shift awareness, understanding, and action for climate and sustainability solutions among mainstream Americans. Bob is an entrepreneur, environmentalist, writer, investor, and distance cyclist. Over the past 25 years, Bob has been president of direct marketing and manufacturing organizations with revenues reaching $600 million, including Cornerstone Brands, Smith & Noble, and Joanna Western Mills. Bob is currently managing partner of Viva Terra LLC and a partner in Arca Equity Partners LLC. In the nonprofit sector, in addition to his work with Eco America, Bob is on the boards of the Environmental Defense Fund, Environmental Defense Fund of North Carolina, and World Bicycle Relief. He also served as a trustee of the Sierra Club Foundation from 2001 to 2007. Bob received a BS in social thought from Lake Forest College and an MBA from Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. He resides in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco with his wife, Lisa Renstrom. Bob has ridden his bike across North and South America, Australia, Europe, and part of Asia, and is currently trying to figure out how to complete the Asia ride and pedal across Africa. With that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Uh, thank you very much, Chris and Aaron, and um, I want to say good morning to all of you, and thank you all for participating in this call. Uh, it's the kind of work that you all do that we copy and take to national scale, and uh, we appreciate everything. We all have to work together, like Chris said, communicate and collaborate to uh, get this planet on the right path. Uh, at Eco America, we are a little bit different of an environmental organization. We see all of it as a social cha change challenge. 
there's various environmental issues and there's things that people care about and for the most part environmental groups kind of communicate to people and what people hear are things that they don't really particularly like. Um, we ask them to sacrifice, uh, we appear like we're preaching to them and what Eco America does is all of our programs have center around groups of people as opposed to a forest or or a toxin or something like that. And then what we do is we try to uh, engage the trusted leaders and tribes where those people gather and inspire them to care about environmental issues. The other thing that's a little bit different about the way that we work is that most environmental groups have to appeal to environmentalists to get money. If you have a, a, a million dollar budget for marketing and you try to spend that on people who don't have money or don't care about the environment, the next year your budget will be smaller and the next year you'll be out of business. So it's critical that, that we all develop messages and programs that reach out to the people that care about our issues. But a lot of times the people that we need to actually get the right outcomes are not those same people. We don't have members, we act as an agency in the background all the time. So uh, we don't have that pressure we can market to uh, people who don't aren't aligned with us. Bob, uh, Bob this is Aaron. Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. We are we aren't seeing your screen yet. Really? Yeah. Have you accepted the Yeah. Um, I I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, here. There we go. Okay. Now let me click one more button. How are we now? Perfect. Okay. Hold on. And get this thing off the screen. Okay. I'm going to just stand right at the bottom. It doesn't go away, Aaron. We are now seeing the climate change as a social. Okay. Try and get rid of the control panel and put it in the background. Oh, you know, you were seeing exactly what we need to see, Bob. You're good. Okay, great. All right, so at any rate, this is a graphic of what I was just talking about, about uh, starting with people as opposed to starting with environmental issues and, and engaging mainstream Americans. And sorry for that uh, little. Um, there now. Not letting me go to okay, all right. <laughs> then uh, what we do is because we deal with different groups of Americans, we do everything we do. We start with research. We we spend right now the, our research budget this year is a little bit over a million dollars. We do communications research, values research. We research different things like children and nature to understand the impact of, of nature on children, and we ground all our programs in this so that we're not talking to ourselves. We uh, um, we get focus groups and, and do uh, dial tests and surveys with the people that we're marketing to so that they we can communicate effectively to them. And then what we do is what, what we call large-scale public engagement programs. We never do less than 15 million people and all of our programs are national. And we don't really believe in communications and marketing per se. Uh, it's very important to get those things right, but to change things, you really have to change institutions and infrastructure. So just a, a couple of our programs here. This is the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, which we launched in 2007. And right now we have uh, over uh, about 670 colleges and universities, including 12 state university systems that have signed up to go climate neutral. This is not a plan to reduce emissions by 20% or 50%. Uh, when the presidents sign up for this, they uh, agree to measure and re report their emissions annually, take seven tangible actions, which include things like curriculum and investment, as well as the usual things like transportation and renewable energy. Uh, and then they, within two years, they have to come up with a plan to go climate neutral and they have to report publicly on both their emissions and their progress on their plan annually. And you can see all those plans. There's over 500 of them right now up at the President's Climate Commitment website from schools as small as Cape Cod College with 250 students to schools like Arizona State and the Los Angeles Community College District which uh, both have over 250,000 students. 
Uh, and, and so there's, um, uh, this is uh, the largest climate neutrality program as far as we know in the world. We've also done uh, pro the SEED program, Sustainable Education and Economic Development. All the programs we do, we partner with people. We l develop and then launch the programs and work with them for a couple of years and then we hand them off so the programs go on forever. This program, uh, we put together a curriculum on sustainability, six different topic areas, uh, faculty development guides, guides for the uh, presidents to implement them. And uh, if the president signs a pledge to green his campus and green his community, help green his community, they can get access to all these resources for free. And about half of America's community colleges have signed up for this program and are participating in, uh, participating in it right now. Uh, all of our audiences we target, um, you know, you can take a look at a, a town or an area and you can say who, should, who's, who are the most important people to get. We look for people uh, that are early on what they call a diffusion curve that will absorb, retain, and diffuse environmental value. And so college students will really get out there, college communities are leaders and they'll get out there with their ideas and train lots of people. Uh, and if you take some other groups of people, like let's say hunters and ang anglers, they might absorb the environmental message, but they don't really diffuse it well. Another group that diffuses well are families, especially moms. And so we did this program called Nature Rocks, and it's about getting kids outside, but even more than that, it's about getting uh, parents to realize that their kids are happier, healthier, smarter when they're in nature, that they have better family bonding, and, uh, and then this program, which we developed with a, a large number of partners, uh, was handed over to uh, uh, Walt Disney Company and the Nature Conservancy. So this is the uh, uh, official early stage uh, engagement program for, uh, for both companies in, uh, in, in getting uh, people into nature. And then a program we just launched about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, is Utopia, where we partnered with the American Public Gardens Associations. There are about uh, uh, 500 gardens with about 70 million annual visitors, and they're doing something similar to what the colleges and universities are doing. They will all be uh, greening their operations, educating their staffs, and if you go into a public garden starting in five or six months from now, and then a year from now, very many of them will be participating, you'll see uh, a minimum of 10 exhibits about climate change in the garden. You'll see things on the website, you'll see things as you walk into the entrances. And again, all these programs, we set them up uh, and we hand them off and our partner, the American Public Gardens Association here, will run this program indefinitely. So uh, with this kind of work, we were approached uh, by the MacArthur Foundation about a year and a half ago. They were interested in getting engaged in climate change and uh, they asked us to produce a plan for them to, to do that. And uh, working with them uh, uh, at about $700,000 in funding, uh, we developed a plan that I'm going to go over right now quickly on how you engage Americans in climate solutions. Uh, the plan has four parts in it. The first part of the section one is about climate change. How did we get here? The economics, the politics, the science because no one on their board or their staff had done any domestic climate work. The second part of it is uh, how do you change America? How do we go from one set of social norms to another? If you're in immigration or marriage equality or tobacco or health care or civil rights, uh, in all those issues, you know, we, we start in one place and then it, it either we already have or we will transition to a new state uh, um, and, and then there's, it turns out that there's a lot of academic research on how that process actually happens. And it happens in roughly the same way, pretty much the same way, at the local level, the state level, and the national level. Uh, so all this stuff here is applicable to, uh, toward your work. So if you know how society changes and you know about climate change, the third section of the plan is applying that theory to practice. And then the fourth section is a specific plan for doing that. So if you take a look at climate change in America, uh, you know, the big indicators, of course, the poles and uh, the spiral graph at the upper left is the amount of ice that's been on the North Pole uh, every month going back to January 1979. 
the inner circle there, the black line is September, and you can see that if you go back to 79.80, there were 16, 17,000 cubic kilometers of ice up there. Last year it was down to, uh, last September it got down to 3,500. Uh, and the graph on the lower right graphs what they call the minimum ice extent, and, and then from the Guardian on May 2nd, uh, you know, the current date for the first time of no more continuous sheet of ice on the North Pole in millions of years is in September of 2015. Now, most Americans don't, can't absorb that and deal with it. It's too big and abstract of a problem. But what they can deal with and understand are uh, the local and regional impacts of climate change, which happen with uh, floods and droughts and storms. And if you take a look at the amount of those that are happening globally, it's not just in the United States, uh, in the 1980s there were typically less than 400 significant uh, natural disasters in the world. Uh, as you got into 95 to 2005, it got up to 600. And now if you look at like the past eight years or so, we're averaging over 800 natural disasters a year. And those things are uh, changing the way we look at climate change. Now, uh, in the past, when we had pollution in the 50s and 60s and 70s, it was very visible. And, and the stuff that we have right now with the acidifying oceans and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you can't see that. And today, you know, whatever position you have, you can find big trusted institutions that will support your view uh, and then the third thing that's happened to society is that all the laws that we passed in the 60s and 70s to clean up our environment have worked. Pretty much everywhere you go in America, the, the, the rivers and the air is a lot cleaner than it was before. Uh, in Washington, D.C., where I just moved three and a half years ago, uh, they just had their first triathlon where they swam across the Potomac River last year, and I wasn't there, but people told me that, you know, five, ten years ago, it was a muddy, dead river, uh, and now it's growing algae and it's healthy. Well, that's because of all the laws that they passed. But it sends a signal to Americans that, 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 you know, uh, that their air and water and atmosphere is in better shape. But what's happening right now, we went from very visible pollution to invisible pollution, but now climate change is becoming real, and people are experiencing that all over America. Uh, right now, you know, that we're having the biggest uh, wildfires ever in, in some states in America. Uh, California, all over the place, there's, you can't go a week without a major environmental disaster in America. And places like Texas are losing whole industries. The cattle industry uh, is losing uh, half a million head of cattle a year. They're cl closing feedlots because they just can't grow stuff there anymore uh, to feed the cattle. Now, this is, uh, this is how people are um, absorbing that information. Every year in January, uh, the Pew, Center, Pew Research Center does uh, the major poll on public policy priorities in America. And you have a list of about 20 things you can choose from. And you don't have to pick one and at the expense of another. You can weigh all of them high or all of them low. But it gives you a chance to compare how concerned you are about issues. For most of the last 30, 40 years, environment has been a top five, six, seven issue. But starting in about 2007, the environment steadily declined. Each of these bars uh, is, is a year, with the black bar on the far right being January 2013. Uh, it's been environment, concern about environment has been declining because of the, the, the better conditions. And just in the past couple of years, it's turned around. And in January 2013, uh, concern about the environment increased dramatically in America. Uh, and then on the far right is global warming, which kind of built its way up um, from 2000 to 2006. And then in 2007, when the climate wars started happening, uh, public concern about global warming started decreasing. And we've just gone through seven years in a row of decreasing public priority for climate solutions until uh, uh, January of this year it turned around. And uh, 
And so a lot of people are, are everybody seems to be recognizing that their, the natural environment around them is changing. Some of them are still calling it environment because climate change is a dog whistle for, uh, you know, for political controversy. Uh, but and other people are, are recognizing that it is climate change. Um, so, so that's where Americans are. And then you say, well, how do we change that? How do we move them toward climate solutions? And uh, it turns out that there's been a lot of academic research on that. But you know, the biggest problem that we have is that if you go back five years ago and you say, was climate change real, caused by humans and harmful, you know, you would get numbers in the neighborhood in, in the 45% range of people that would agree to that. Those numbers have gone way up right now, and some polls are almost 80%. But at the same time as you went back five years ago uh, and you said, can we fix climate change or do something about it, you were in the neighborhood of 80% of people saying, yeah, we can fix it. And that number has gone down to the 45% range. So what's happened is, is we've gone from kind of denying the problem to fatalism and resignation in just without stopping in the middle and saying, let's do something about it. Uh, so the first thing you have to do if to um, uh, address the problem is to understand that we can solve it. All we have to do is you know, increase conservation by 2% a year for 20 years, increase renewable energy by 2% for 20 years. Um, there's a lot of different plans out there that show various paths forward where you can get to 100% uh, clean energy uh, in a reasonable period of time and really have impact on the problem. So, but, so if you have to start with that and then you get into the academic stuff about how you use that information to get America to change it's in a meaningful way, it's uh, action and priority on climate change. And, and the academic theory that uh, we found to be the best one is taught at Harvard and, and, and Berkeley and a lot of other schools uh, is something that's called a MAP model by a guy by the name of Bill Moyer. And what happens with almost every social issue is that the what we call the high resource people, people with a lot of education and money, get way ahead of the general population on the issue. And then they try to push legislation or solutions to the problem, but the public is not with them. The public is it, it hasn't warmed up to the idea yet. And usually, like with healthcare or or tobacco or even the first generation environmental laws, they uh, they are either very weak or they fail altogether. And it's not usually until the second time, and it's usually six to thirty years later when you come up with uh, with the public support knowledge and information builds up and then you have enough public support to be able to do something about the issue. So we look at those models and then we commission the variety of studies that says what happens if there's large corporate opposition to social change and things like you know the tobacco industry and uh, we had American University uh, School of Communications look at the, the, the positives and negatives of the change in these kinds of campaigns and they came up with what they called success factors for each of these campaigns. So we took a look at all of those and then we combined them with what the American climate movement has accomplished already. Uh, you know, six years ago climate change was not a significant national issue. People said it was kind of, you know, they were getting more concerned about it, but it wasn't a national debate. It wasn't on the news uh, all the time. So we've we've managed to uh, make it a national itch issue and in the same time we've come up with a lot of policy solutions, a lot of technical solutions. We have built an infrastructure of lobbying and companies uh, and, and NGOs out there that are all able to address climate change in various different ways. Uh, we did not have that infrastructure a decade ago. So we can move forward based on those things. Uh, and so if you take the, the theoretical models, the practical examples, what we've accomplished so far, and then you put them together and say, what do we need to do to solve for climate change in America? And this report says we need these 12 different things. And I'm not going to go through them on this slide. I have a, a couple slides on others uh, on the important ones uh, um, coming up here. But these are uh, the 12 factors that we need to do to uh, move America toward climate solutions. 
and we put them together from theory to practice in a new climate campaign. And here the important thing is to realize, starting out, that uh, there are new realities out there. Five years ago, probably most of us on this call believed in a concept called peak oil, which basically said that the world is going to peak out at, has peaked out at 88 million barrels a day of oil, and we are uh, never going to get beyond that, and demand is going to increase, and the price of oil is going to skyrocket, and we've got, an, a, lot of, got a lot of signals that way as the price of oil in uh, gasoline in America has gone up you know, to above $4 uh, in many places around the country over the past uh, number of years. So, but now we know that you know there's peak oil at thirty dollars a barrel. But if it's one hundred and twenty dollars a barrel, maybe not. Uh, you can do fracking. You can do shale oil. Right now, we've gone in just one decade from ten percent of the oil on the planet, from one percent of all the oil on the planet, to ten percent coming from deep water uh, drilling platforms. Uh, so, you know, if oil goes up to two hundred and fifty dollars a barrel, we can probably get it from anywhere. This entire planet is made of carbon and uh, and it's just a matter of finding the, the least expensive ways of getting it out of the planet and burning it. Uh, but when you do burn it, that is causing the visible impacts that we've talked about. And the shifts in public opinion, when you get a major national poll taking a directional shift like that, it means that Americans are starting to pay attention again. So what we need to do is figure out how to accelerate and amplify that process. Uh, and so this, this thing that's called Momentous, uh, which is a campaign that we're working on with a number of people, has six different things that it's going to do to try to help uh, accelerate and amplify the process. The first thing is what's called a principles-based solutions framework. There are a lot of different solutions to climate change. When if, if it's gun control and you go up to you know Obama, you can say, "Hey, we need we don't need to have these big magazines and automatic weapons, and you can you know solve a lot of the problem." Uh, in climate, there are five large categories of policy solutions. You can do a carbon tax. You can do a market-based mechanism like cap and trade. You can invest in renewables and conservation. You can do uh, an Alaska permanent fund concept. Uh, and, and so you have all these different groups that are uh, focusing on different types of solutions uh, and, and we have to figure out how do we all work together with those different solutions. These are the two different uh, solutions framework, one for the health care bill, the statement of common purpose, and one, the current one, uh, that the Alliance for Citizenship, the people that are working on the immigration bill are. And what they do is they agree to a visionary statement at the top and then they agree to uh, uh, a set of principles um, of what they will support because they don't necessarily know, you know, which way parts of these issues are going to go, like in healthcare. But if, but it, they say that if it fits these core principles, we'll support the bill whichever way it goes. And then the third thing that uh, these have uh, embedded in them is something that is called a commitment of what the people that are signing it are going to do. So we need to develop for the environmental community, for the climate and sustainability community, we need to develop some foundation for all of us to work together. The second thing is a master narrative. And when issues first come up, they've come up in kind of aggressive, confrontational ways, uh, abstract ways. So like health care uh, for decades was something called universal health care. And people didn't really want that. and, and gay rights, uh, you know, why do they get any more rights than we get? But what happens is as you get into the mainstream part of the movement, then they say you start connecting the issues with core values and where Americans are at. So everybody gets it <coughs> that uh, smoking tobacco is a bad thing and you say that kids, you know, people in airplanes and then you get to restaurants and you say kids, the, the, the campaign that actually Actually pushed it off uh, over the top was something called a uh, uh, campaign for tobacco for free kids, which was funded at about thirty million dollars. You don't want nobody wants their kids hanging around a room full of cigarette smoke, and people get that. You make uh, the issues much more tangible and personal to Americans, and then they are able to shift their perspectives on it. So, <laughs> so this is something else that we don't have. We are still in most of our messaging on climate change is still 
polar bears, planetary destruction. There's two different models of communications on climate change right now. One of them we call the planetary destruction model, and the other one is what we call the social benefits, that if we solve it, we're going to have all these green jobs. And most Americans aren't against green jobs, but they don't think that they're going to have one or they're ever going to know anybody that have, has one. So those kinds of arguments, they do make sense, but to a lot of Americans, it's not, nothing that they can connect to. So we have to come up with a narrative that they can connect to. The third thing is that when you look at how society changes, the politics on issues are usually laggards, not leaders. And, and when you do the first pass at trying to solve an issue in public policy, you go to the leaders and you say, leaders solve it. Uh, but what happens is, is that uh, as different sectors of society flip and society flips, then politics follows after that. So if you have, let's say, in marriage equality, if you have 490 of the Fortune 500 companies providing equal benefits to their employees, you know, Sooner or later, the politicians catch on that this issue is basically over with, and 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 we're going to lose support if we keep uh, uh, promoting a legacy position that most citizens don't want. So what we have to do is we have to flip sectors of American society to care about climate change. To a large extent, uh, you know, the higher education program. We've done other work in higher education. We've done four big programs that are like the Princeton Review Guide to Colleges. Every college is ranked by sustainability right now. And if you flip to page like 9 or 11 in the guidebook, depending upon the year, it says that Eco-America developed those rating systems. But, you know, so when you have, uh, you know, that whole sector, if you went back 10 years ago, no schools were going climate neutral. No schools were measuring and reporting their emissions. No schools had sustainability officers. And now, uh, over 40% of the students in higher education in America, including community colleges, are going to schools that are going climate neutral. So the sector has kind of flipped. And then the question is, is you know, how do we do that to the other sectors? And you do it with roughly the same model. We call this institutional engagement by sector, and we get leaders of leaders and organizations of organizations to uh, agree to uh, change their behaviors and communi to communicate it to their stakeholders. Um, if you just get 75 evangelical ministers to say climate change is a problem, do something, that's a great statement. It certainly doesn't hurt, but it doesn't really change things much. If those same 75 ministers say this is a big problem, and by the way, my congregation, my denomination is going to do something about that. We're going to go climate neutral. We're going to go climate positive, uh, and we're going to help all of our parishioners uh, do the same thing. Then you get the tribal leaders, you get the tribe, and you flip the sector. So what this plan is trying to do is do that in uh, uh, six sectors, and then there's a, a seventh that's called new constituencies. Um, which makes up uh, civ civic organizations and other things that don't fit neatly into some of these other sectors. So, uh, the fourth thing is uh, leadership. Uh, everybody in America looks to leaders to get cues on what to think about things. Uh, you don't have time to really understand and learn about all the issues around you. So progressives with Obamacare, they say, you know, I'm for Obamacare, it's a good thing. But if you say to them, well, tell me something about it, they might be able to tell you it covers more people, but they really don't know about the health care bill. They can't explain it to you. For most Americans, that's the way it is about climate. They know there's a problem out there and the, the world's getting warmer, but that is probably as far as they go. So they need to look to other people to say, what are they doing? What am I supposed to do? And so a big part of it is cultivating leaders, not only because they bring their tribes with them, but also they bring a broader swath of society. So we're doing a lot in each of these uh, seven circles. We're building up a, a group of 20 nationally recognized leaders. Some of them are what we call green verticals, which are a lot of us on this call where we're at the full-time intersection of climate and sustainability and whatever it could be uh, ecosystem or it could be you know like green faith where it's faith and the environment 
uh, but we're, we're full time. And then there's other mainstream leaders that um, that we sign up that uh, really care about the issue and want to lend time uh, and their name to doing something about it. But they're busy running a city or they're running a hospital or a, a company. And then there's thought leaders who are authors and academics and journalists. So we're building all these leadership circles to build leadership behind this to, to move the whole process forward. And then the uh, next thing that we're doing is uh, we are um, doing, uh, going to do a lot more research to support work in these sectors, and we're going to share it broadly. We've got a, a very full research agenda. Usually we've gotten out about two research projects a year. Uh, now we're going to be switching to, starting in about a month and a half, we're going to get on a major research project once a month. And uh, they will be on things like the healthcare sector and how it engages in climate change. They'll be on American values and what they think about the local and regional impacts of climate change and how they can use that to, uh, how Americans understand that and what they are concerned about it. So we can better connect with uh, Americans and, and work together to get them to help us solve the problem. Uh, and then at the end of the day, um, no big national uh, effort ever achieves success unless there's some national campaign that pulls it together. Now, there's a variety of campaigns on here, some of which were very effective, like the Earth Day campaign and pa passing uh, bills uh, you know, in the late 60s and, and primarily in the 70s. Uh, uh, and then, you know, the health care bill, uh, the marriage equality, the human rights campaign. Uh, so, you know, we have to, at the end of the day, come up with a, a kind of national brand and campaign that will pull all of us together and get us working uh, on the same cam campaign so that, uh, you know, EDF is working on their program and the Nature Conservancy is working on their own programs. We've got to find a way to all work together. So this is kind of the process that we're involved in doing that, where we're organizing, talking to people in all these sectors, building up the leadership groups. We've got about 120 of the 200 plus leaders already signed up. Uh, and then we're building that, that uh, principles-based solutions framework and master narrative. We guide and support, we do not lead, and these leadership groups that we're putting together will actually make the decisions on what's going to happen in these um, in these programs, and then for each of the six sectors on that left column there, we will do we will create a program that will help pull that sector together. Now, there's a lot of work being done in every one of these sectors right now. I've uh, been spending a lot of time in the municipality sector over the past couple of weeks, and there's uh, uh, you know the inst the urban sustainability directors network. There's ICLE. There's like six or seven national groups. There's the C40 city groups uh, that are all working to green cities. But what they're all doing is they're working to green cities. They're work worried about transportation and building codes and adaptation and those kinds of things. But when you look at what they're doing, you say, what are they doing to engage the people in those cities to support that work? And there's basically none of that that's going on. So the work that we're doing here is kind of complementary and supportive of the work that other people are doing. Uh, we, you're not going to come to any of the momentous websites and find out how a city should adapt to climate change, but you will find us pointing to other people for that. And you will find us saying, if you want to talk to people and build support for a, a climate preparedness effort in your city, what you need to do is, here's, what you need, here's your six steps to do. So we're going to build up all those uh, all those resources for people who want to work on climate change. Now, getting to a real practical level here, you go back to the beginning, which is the communications and the marketing. And we do these focus groups and we do these um, surveys and we'll do, we literally will do 16 focus groups, a thousand people in dial tests and a thousand people in surveys to really understand how they uh, think about an issue. And then we've come up with a variety of things which we put together in <coughs> training programs for NOAA and for other people uh, on, on engaging people in, in climate solutions. And these are uh, 10 different things that are pretty important things to do when you talk to people. And the first thing is don't start with your issue, start with them. If it's a faith group, if it's a, if it's a town, if it's people in a, in a regional area, 
always really understand your audience and truly start with them. The second thing is, is that when you talk about climate change, and this holds if you are going into a, a, a party at a friend's house, you know, uh, if you start talking about climate change, people will generally turn off, no matter if you're a progressive or if you're a conservative, they are fatigued or they've been taught to believe certain things about it, but, or if, if you're making a speech, what you have to do is you connect on values and, and what we call it dialing up. So if you say, I think America's going the wrong direction and we got a lot of problems. Well, if you've got 40 people behind a little mirror and they all have little dials, they all dial up and you'll have 90% of agreement with them. And then what you have to do, the second thing you do is you, you express ambivalence and says and uncertainty here. Uh, we're losing the word uncertainty. You have to acknowledge ambivalence. You have to say, and some people think this and some people think that. And then what it does is it keeps everybody in the room and it opens them up to listening. And then you say, you know, you know, um, uh, you know, I live in this community. I've got two kids. I go to this school. My mom does this. My, you know, and you establish really good personal con connections. And then from there, on your fourth or fifth thing, then you can start talking about from personal experience. You start saying, and you know, from what I can see here, you know, I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the pond in my backyard when I was a kid, it used to have ice on it every year. And I used to go ice skating and sledding, and we haven't been able to do that for the last decade. So there's clearly something happen, happening. So sequence and how you connect matters. The second thing is that it's always better to, uh, there's a concept of code words, and, and certain words are dog whistle words. And if you say global warming, you know, people, it lights up a whole set of lights in people's brain and they, and you have to deal with this preconceived thing they have. But, but if you build up and you describe it and you say, you know, the, you know, the pond is not ice anymore and, and, you know, and if, you know, the birds are coming, whatever the local things are that the people would notice and you describe what's happening as opposed to labeling it, you keep people from dialing down. Another code word is science. <coughs> Ordinary Americans know that science is very fungible. You know, you're supposed to eat eggs, you're not supposed to eat eggs. That, you know, you're supposed to have a high protein diet, you're not supposed to eat any meat. You're and so they know that what they hear from scientists, what they read on the front page of their new newspaper in six months could be exact opposite a year and a half later. And so they don't have, they don't have in their mind that, that, you know, that science is a permanent well-known thing. Uh, and uh, and, and most of them, the vast majority of Americans, don't have any significant uh, uh, education in science. So we tell them, you know, we always say, you know, uh, use trusted messengers, and then we tell them talk about science. Well, people don't have a lot of confidence in science. So I, when I talk to scientists, I tell them do a search and replace on your computer. Type in the word science and then replace it with the word fact, because climate change is real. And if you're going to start out by saying well, you know, that hurricane, you know, you really can't attribute any one of them to climate change. You know, what you really need to say is you need to start from confidence and say that climate change affects all weather. The question is, is how much did it affect this storm? And then there's other words like adaptation. Uh, and until about April of last year, I was always, um, you know, what we have to do is mitigate, then we have to uh, adapt, and then we have to geoengineer. And I, except for examples, I try to avoid using the word adaptation right now because when you go through and you test that word, it is very, uh, very passive for mainstream Americans. It is demobilizing for activists. And if you go to the American Petroleum Institute, you can see what they need, what they recommend about climate change. They recommend adaptation. So to the extent that you are saying that my town needs to adapt to climate change, you're working for the uh, fossil fuel industries in America. So, and the word that, and there's, this is in research reports that are on our website. You, all of them are there. You can just download them. The word that, that pops up is best for talking about what we need to do about climate change is preparation. It says that climate is real. There's an emergency. It could happen. I can do something about it. My community should get ready. So if you say climate preparation or preparedness instead of adaptation, it lights up a different lights in people's minds that can deal with it. The other thing is you don't want to uh, uh, argue with people. You want to talk about values and philosophies, not 350 parts per million. Uh, you, you know, you train animals, you don't train people. 
People do not want to be educated. If you say, i got to educate you about climate change, that means you know, know more than they do. You want to be inspiring and empowering. Uh, each of us have messengers that we trust and ones that we don't. Uh, you know, progressives, for some reason, trust celebrities. If Robert Redford says climate change is real, you know, people think, hey, well, that's a problem. i got to do something about it. But if you talk to most conservative people and you say, Robert Redford thinks of climate change, they'd say, well, why are you listening to Robert Redford on climate change? But in the same extent, a lot of conservatives believe in their uh, local faith leader. And if that faith leader says it, but if you go to a progressive, why should the minister in Charleston, South Carolina, local minister, know more about climate change than anybody? Uh, so what you have to do is you have to find the uh, uh, trusted messengers that your audience will connect with and not use the ones that they don't connect with. Uh, and again, if you always make it personal and then scale up, you know, my backyard, my community, and it seems to be happening all over the planet. Uh, and then another thing that we've learned from the dial test is that, you know, if like in the, we're applying this with the American Public Gardens Association, you know the grasslands. It's getting warmer. There's less water. The grasslands and the Great Plains are drying up. That's just what's going on. And then what you say, we do what we call a five to one ratio of solutions to problems. And we say that uh, the, the, the federal government is doing this. The local university is doing this. The community that I live in is doing this. This company is doing this. And oh by the way, people like me are doing this. So there's these little five bubbles of solutions are at the bottom of each of the uh, changes in the flora that the gardens are concerned about. Uh, the, and then when you look at, when you test those things and people just, okay, well, there's that problem, and then you get them dialing up. If you start saying climate change is real and it's impacting us this way, everybody dials down and it's really hard once you create a negative first impression to get them to come back up. So, and, and then the last point here uh, on this whole thing is that, you know, message discipline is critical. This, none of this stuff should be casual. Uh, so our two things are trying to get those messages and marketing right, but actually change the institutions and infrastructure uh, and get the tribes and tribal leaders uh, that are out there in people's everyday lives to do something about climate change. And when we do that, we can change America. So that is the end of my uh, talk here, Chris and Aaron. So take us wherever you want us to go. Okay, great, Bob. Thanks so much. I'm going to leave your last slide up for a little bit while we go through um, Q&A. And I just want to encourage folks, if you, ha if you joined us a little late, um, if you have any questions, just please chat them in using your control panel, and we will answer them. Um, in the order that we receive them. So thanks so much. And we do have a few questions, Bob. Okay. So let me get started here. Um, have the colleges that signed the College President's Climate Commitment Program been able to leverage their commitment to divest funds from fossil fuel companies similar to what Bill McKibben and 350 are advocating for? Uh, the divestment campaign is less than a year old right now, and it is a spectacular idea. It's what we call a replicable, replicable constructive action. And all movements have things that you can just hear about it and see it and then do it yourself without having, like, kind of like Occupy setting up the camp. So it's a great thing, and it's gaining momentum. It is not part of the president's climate commitment formally. Uh, there's a group of presidents that are running it, uh, and I doubt that it will be for a while, even though they are moving toward climate. Institutionally, they change slowly, but it's a great idea, and, uh, and it's not part of it yet, but schools are starting to do it. Okay, great. Um, here we have another question. Using the MAP model in the tobacco campaign for historical precedent, is it possible to gauge year by year where we are on the MAP climate movement? Would that be achieved by looking at the Pew Public Polling, for example? Uh, there is actually a book, John Isham at Middlebury uh, College in uh, uh, Vermont and a couple of other authors applied the MAP model to climate change back in 2009. And they kind of got it a little bit wrong. They, were, they thought that the, um, you know, the first pass was like in the late 70s, early 80s when Bill McKibben and the first word got out and they thought that we were in, with the cap and trade bills that we were at the, that, that second level and we were ready to pass the bill. 
but uh, um, but at any rate, so it has been applied to climate change, and uh, social change is discontinuous. What happens is like with the Arab Spring, or even like things like marriage equality, you go for a long time with basically nothing that happens, and all of a sudden over the course of two or three years, you get 12 or 16 states, and then more every other month, you know, passing bills. That's what's going to happen with climate change. And what we need to do is we need to be ready to help society move toward good solutions when society hits the inflection point or the tipping point. And so those polls will um, provide guidance and indicators, but those are kind of like lagging, lagging indicators. Uh, you, you, you look at them and you say, yeah, it looks like we're ready, but it's kind of like you don't time your investments. It's really hard to time the social change. Right now, a lot of people are working toward 2015, and I think it's COP21 in Paris, uh, as, uh, as there's a lot of international leaders and, and people in America that are, and then plus all the impacts, it looks like there's a variety of things that are moving toward climate solutions. And we're hoping that we can get something done in the next three years. Uh, and polling would be is helpful, but it's it's really hard to predict. Okay, thank you. Um, here we have another question. Can you please elaborate on the point of engaging 15% to 40% of each sector, and to what extent does this segment need to be engaged? Is it merely that 15 to 40% need to be educated, or that they actually need to take a stance? You know, these are um, really articulate questions, and it's this huge difference between, I guess, when people write them down and when people say, the 15, <laughs> uh, 15 to 40 percent is, um, you know, there, is, there are uh, social change theories, and the name escapes me about, you know, that, uh, that you get, you know, a core group of people, and then you hit the tipping point. And usually it's around uh, in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent on every issue. Uh, we have some of the sectors we have are huge, like the healthcare industry in America is 21% of the GDP. It is uh, employs you know tens of millions of people, and 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 there's so many different subgroups in it with the hospitals, the healthcare providers, the insurance companies, the drug companies, the professional associations, and so we actually subcategorize these big sectors and approach them in a kind of a, a logical way. Other sectors like higher education, yeah, that's, I mean, there's there's 19 million students in higher education today rotating through the community colleges, colleges, and universities. There's uh, about 12 million people that are engaged in supporting that as faculty, staff, uh, and and uh, administrators. And But uh, um, so the 15 to 40 percent thing, you know, we think that we, we're going to be able to get that in cohesive uh, smaller sectors like healthcare and maybe even in faith, the big ones like business and healthcare, well, the, we won't get 40 percent. It'll probably be, you know, we'll, we'll shoot for 15 percent. And yes, we think what we have, what we call that they have to be proactively engaged in it is our thing. They can't, they, you know, you just can't say, you know, that, that uh, like at the higher education, we can say that those students and those people are going to schools that are actually doing something now. Um, so we're, we're not going. We're not going for just hey, you know, the American Hospital Association says green, and therefore uh, they are. You know, we get uh, you know six million people or whatever it is. They actually have to do and implement the programs and engage their people. Okay, great. We do have another question that just came in. Um, it is tough to inspire people when the facts are so dire. Focusing on engaging activities that make small differences can be discouraging. Is there a way to make people more aware of the importance of these steps without depressing them with the reason climate change of why they are necessary? The, um, I have a problem with people who say small things don't make a difference. Uh, 71% of the economy in America is based on consumers, and consumers have a lot of power. Uh, the least expensive and easiest thing to change is behaviors. It costs you nothing to accelerate a little bit slowly or turn off a light. It saves money, and it only adds benefit to everything around you. Uh, and then saying that small actions on climate change aren't really helpful is like saying your vote doesn't count. 
uh, we know from our research that people change as a package. So if, if you change your perspective on climate change as a national issue, an international issue, as a local issue, as a personal issue, you change it across the board. So getting people to act on, uh, there are some people think that you have to educate people and then behaviors follow. There are other people at the University of Michigan that think that you change behaviors and then, and then attitudes and awareness follow. Both of them work in different ways with different people, but uh, engaging people on small stuff can be a really powerful thing to do with Nest thermostat uh, and things like that will changes consciousness. So, uh, what, so one part of it is that. The other part is the optimism versus the pessimism. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's really, you know, we have baked a lot of, of carbon pollution into the system, but uh, it's just like with a river. If a river is polluted, you stop polluting, and then you got to wait 20 or 30 years before the ecosystem cleans it up. That's just the way it is, and that's what's going to happen to the planet. And everything that we do right now today uh, is going to make a huge difference in the future, and we need to, we need to start working on it. The river isn't going to change tomorrow, and the planet isn't going to change tomorrow. But, uh, you know, another way of looking at it is that if we just took 5% of all the money that we spend on fossil fuels and invested in renewables and conservation, we'd, we'd have so much money to spend, we wouldn't be able to spend it effectively to switch. There's a, there's a lot of, in our, <coughs> you do have to counter the fatalism and resignation. There are a lot of solutions that lead to uh, solving the climate crisis. And when we get to the other side of it, it's, it's a really beautiful place. Imagining being able to get all of your energy without having to burn things. Everybody knows that burning is bad. So uh, you definitely need to find ways to counter the fatalism and resignation, which are like that one slide I have, which might not be that good. Uh, and then you know, give people hope and make, let them know that they make a difference. Don't disempower them and tell them, sorry, changing your light bulb doesn't make a difference. Because maybe your light bulb doesn't, but your vote doesn't either then. Great. Thank you, Bob. We do have one last really quick question, um, and then we'll wrap it up. How can local groups feed into the Momentus Network? Uh, as we set it up, we're, we're phasing it in three different phases. The first phase are what we call the eco-humanitarian groups and the faith groups. Then we're doing uh, municipalities and higher education. Then we're doing healthcare and business. And the first programs will be coming online September, October of this year. Um, we will in July. We will have a, a website up, and you will be able to sign up. And then when we start launching the programs, we'll get you we'll get you a monthly update of where we are, and then we will um, uh, and then we will keep you posted. But all the resources that we have, we hope to have. You know, uh, you know, every group that is on this call, we hope to that you will join the join and support stuff and contribute. There's going to be you know a lot of all like it started out with all the answers are out there and groups like the people that are participating in this call and we want to provide a platform for you to share what you have your success stories celebrate your leadership uh, and engage you in in the collective action of all of us working together to solve climate change so there will be those mechanisms uh, you'll be able to start signing up in July and you'll start getting resources uh, in September and October Great, Bob. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I want to thank everyone on the call for attending today's Southeast Coastal Climate Network webinar. SESA is very excited to take part in this webinar series, and we would like to thank all of our members on this call and encourage those of you who are not members to please join us today. For more information, please check out our website, cleanenergy.org, and I also encourage you to view our blog and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Again, today's presentation will be available on the webinar archive page of our website. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you.